work out? Do you guys um, practice what you preach? Like, do you all work out with the same amount of reps, uh, sets, and intensities? I mean, like, each of us all of you, like, you all work, work out the fact that I work out the same way. No, like, when you say... just do it with whoever has the mic. Instead of playing, just talking. No, like I just want to understand the question. You have to find the parameters. He's asking if we practice what we preach. Do we yeah, have to like, take the things we talk about and put them in practice? Yes, yeah, pretty much. Yeah. Uh, funny story. It took me probably 10 years before I was effectively able to program for myself. And I knew that, and I had coaches, um, which kind of speaks to the value of all of our professions, is that it doesn't really matter how much knowledge you have. Um, your ability to like self-regulate and uh, not be stupid is, is not the same. Um, so I would say that these days I do a pretty good job of practicing what I, what, I, what, I, what I preach, but I was not able to do that without a coach for probably until like 2013. Yes. <laughs> I'll say yes. How about that, <laughs> I'll say yes, and I'll add to that that um, personally, like uh, a lot of the programming I do for my clients, a lot of times I won't program in something unless it's something I've done or tried myself. You know, especially if I'm experimenting with something new. Um, and I'm thinking about using it on a client, I'll actually do it on myself first before I even try it on a client. Because I want to see, it's not going to work on me, not that anything's going to work on me, it's going to work on a client, but at least I want to know how it feels, like you know, if I'm doing a certain set rep scheme or a certain intensity technique, I want to see how it feels on myself before I submit the client to it. So. <laughs> okay. I tried, is this this one? Okay. I, uh, I tried lifting weights. It was painful, mildly annoying. <laughs> I did a couple reps. I had a thousand up. I do not lift weights. Um, yeah. No, I mean, yeah, of course. Yeah. I try to live my life uh, to be as much uh, machine like as possible. Um, so I can get as jacked and lean as I can without killing myself too much. And uh, we'll see what that happens. I think all of us got into this probably for selfish reasons, right? Like, no, you completely. I did it just to help others. We're all full of shit. Uh, and we all got in terms of like we wanted the answers to stuff because we read you, we bought our phone says one thing, you know, we wanted to know for ourselves. So like, we were the first people that we experimented on to do this. I was doing blood flow restriction back in 2007 because I read about the meta analysis. <laughs> And I, I'm, I'm a brag. I was the one who was Jeremy Lennox who was in the gym and said, what are you doing? And now he's done the most research of like anybody on that. But it, it's something that I experimented on myself first because I want to know. Like I want to know. Like I tell people, like, I think all of us would say, we care about getting the right answer when we care about being right. Because if you're wrong, that's actually a beautiful thing because it means you weren't doing everything you possibly could right and you get better. <laughs> who, who picks the question? Yeah, I have a question. Go on. Um, <laughs> <you're> <laughs> <not enough. laughs> Anyone can answer this one. Um, I don't have my face here because I'm talking about the ketogenic diet here. Now, I've had a, some really high success with females specifically. Like, let's say, for example, they're on 1800 calories and you've even tried to reverse them or, or whatever it might be, and, and then they just start dieting and they can't lose the weight at all. And then at the moment, I've kept the calories the same, and I've switched it straight over. And I know immediately the first week or two, that's fine, they'll drop a bit, but consistently get themselves into like amazing shape. But yet, the hard diet did nothing whatsoever, but calories the same, but the result is, oh, gee, what's the reason behind that? I, I don't know, I just know it did work. So they're losing more weight than ketogenic? Yeah, they're getting in, they can't get in the shape at all. You know, let's say they're eight weeks out from the show. <coughs> try cutting calories, carbs, etc., and, and you hit a wall, so you switch them over to ketosis, and, and they continue on and actually get in shape. Um, well, this is, so this is cool, because this is what we would call um, anecdotal evidence, which is not like stupid evidence. It's on there, right? It's, it's, it's useful information. I think we're using almost exclusively anecdotal evidence and observation when we work with our clients after we've initially set things up. So I'm never going to tell you well, no, you should stop doing this working because this is an article. No, definitely, if it's working really effectively and they're healthy and making great progress and they weren't before, keep doing it. Uh, as far as why, um, well, 
I'll give you some other observational research, which is basically just kind of like peer-reviewed anecdotes. Uh, there was recently a study published, I don't know if you guys saw this, on, on British um, natural bodybuilders, and they were looking at what their macronutrient breakdown was. And among the most successful, um, the, guy, the guys who presumably get in really good shape, they're typically on higher carb diets relative to the rest of the field. And that's something I've consistently observed uh, in, in natural bodybuilding, because someone I've been in the game for well, over a decade now. Um, and I haven't personally seen a difference in relative carb intakes as far as what is most effective for men and women. Um, absolute, sure, that's because you know they're, they're, they're lighter and they don't need as many calories. Um, now, there are some times when, there are individuals who respond better to ketogenic diets. Uh, we ran a, a case study of five individuals, males and females, it's a case study, so this is again, we're talking kind of anecdotal evidence, which is the best we got for this population. Uh, and we had a mixture of powerlifters and weightlifters. Uh, and we looked at their performance curve over time, and then their uh, reported calorie intake and their changes in body, in body, body mass and, and body composition. And the thing that was most consistent across all of them would initially, for one to four weeks when they went on a ketogenic diet, uh, they stopped consuming as many calories. So there was a hunger blunting response that's pretty consistently reported. So when I hear about people who've done great on a ketogenic diet, um, I don't think it's just water loss. Sometimes I think you will see uh, better dietary adherence from that in certain people, but not always. Uh, there was one person who, after that initial loss of, of weight calories, <coughs> gained more than they started. Uh, and then as far as performance, which is important for these folks, not really relevant to your question, two people plateaued and made no further progress in terms of their strength, which means that they were progressing before and they went on a ketogenic diet and they stopped. Uh, one person actually lost strength, both Wilkes score and absolute, and then two people did not alter their, their curve of performance at all. So what that tells you is that some people are going to respond better to a ketogenic diet. Uh, the whys, we're probably still figuring that out, but it's not, it's not the norm, I would yeah. say. There's a common thread though that a lot of them that are up there in this boat are, have a history of crash dieting. Yep. You know what I mean? Like multiple shows up year after year after year. So obviously the, that process of carbs is just ineffective. So whether it's just a complete change, I don't know. But the result is... I'd be surprised if there's something truly metabolic. I would, I would guess it's something yeah. to do with their relationship with food. Yeah. You're yeah. removing some potential triggers. Um, and we've well, tried to reverse it. Some of them have <coughs> actually tried to increase carbs. The minute the carbs go up, it's like they just... Soften up. Uh, I you think, think something to, to. I'm trying to look at. No, I'm talking to you. Oh, <laughs> oh really? Yeah, um, so I think one of the things, I'm not using this thing. So, <laughs> um, I think one of the things that uh, you don't want to underestimate is when you're cutting out a food group, you're actually also just inherently reducing the standard error of diet. Like, we, we don't want to minimize that. And with the way most people are taught to ketogenic diet, you're removing a lot of multi-ingredient foods just by default. Foods that have a higher standard error in terms of what their actual macronutrient composition could be. So I think, as Eric said, dietary adherence. Also, it's just a change. So they probably heard so much positive stuff about ketogenic diets. They might be just convinced it's going to work. And as woo as it sounds, if you believe something, you are more likely for it to work. If you don't believe it's going to work, it's not going to work. Um, so I think that there's, but like Eric said, is there something metabolic to that? I would be really surprised if there was. I'm not ruling it out because, as we said, there are outliers, but I would be surprised if something actually metabolic. But, as he said, we're not going to tell somebody who says, hey, this is working, to, to, to stop working. What I think we would like to say to people is, we just don't believe it's magic. We don't believe that there's something inherently physiological. They also, they also perform better too. So mentally they perform better because they feel better. So then that goes on maybe with their results that way directly. Uh, just to add to that, this is more maybe a little bit more gen pop than competitors, but I think it, probably, it might apply here as well. Um, so there's a 2005 study by Brandon colleagues where they compared a, a low carb diet to a low fat diet. And they measured like energy expenditure <laughs> and all these other things. And the low carb group lost, you know, more weight and fat, both groups were reporting the same number of calories, but when the researchers you know, looked at daily energy expenditure, basically what they found was that the high carb group was not accurately reporting their calories and the low carb group was more accurately reporting. So it was actually 
there was a big difference in the accuracy of reporting. And so like when Lance says, when you cut out a major food group like carbs, which also means you're cutting out a lot of energy dense foods like cakes, cookies, ice cream, whatever, um, which is usually actually carbs and fat that you're cutting out, um, you're most likely going to be more accurate just in, in your self-report. And that's something we've got to remember with self-report. I mean, let's, let's face it guys, people are shitty at self-report. Even competitors, I'm sorry, like a lot of people think they're good, but it's like, I mean, there's research showing that professional dietitians underreport their calorie intake. We're talking professional dietitians. So, um, you know, I mean, I even think of myself, I, I like to think I'm pretty good at tracking my calorie intake, but on a day to day basis, there are times where I got to estimate things. I got to, and you know what? I'm going to be off. I'm just going to be off. And so. Uh, another possibility might be that the initial water weight loss. Is the first loss they've experienced in a while mm -hmm. because they're the ones that weren't working, and it gets them where they go on psychologically momentum train, and then they like you know. So for example, if shit's just not working, you might like have some crackers by yourself and be like, "Fuck," and then like the next meal you're like, "I was a bitch. I shouldn't have done that," and then you're back on track. But if you got the the keto train rolling and you lost a couple of kilos in the first week, you're like, no one's fucking stopping me. You don't cheat anymore because, and also cheating now means two things. If you're gonna cheat, it means uh, both breaking your momentum and violating the stated rule of a low carb diet because nobody cheats with fucking low carb. <laughs> I just made bacon slices, maybe. <laughs> so those two factors, and whatever everyone else said, uh, I think that might be I said that wrong. <laughs> I listen to everybody. Next question. Um, I think everything goes uh, back there, John. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, um, yeah, so I just wanted to ask a question. Sort of, you all mentioned like the logical fallacies, and you've all sort of, uh, <coughs> you're very across the idea of constructing and deconstructing arguments, which seems supplementary to what you guys do as sort of public intellectuals and academics. Is there, any other, is there any other things that you've found to be supplementary to what you do outside of just exploring more exercise and you know nutrition research? I mean, in terms of furthering our own education? Just your ability to sort of be good at your job, I guess. Sort of, su yeah, supplementary to reading more and more you know, nutrition or more and more exercise research. Does that make sense? So, yeah, I'd like to just work. clarify, is this something that we would be, something we, we believe is worth promoting to our audience, or something that we personally do to make us better at our jobs? Yeah, so you personally, like, the second one? During, yeah, like during an undergrad, I, well, at least I didn't experience any education on logical fallacies or constructing and deconstructing an argument. It was just, here's exercise physiology, here's this, here's that. Whereas you, you seem to have incorporated elements from other fields and professions at least to enhance and supplement your ability as what you do within this field. Yeah, so I, I, this is what's coming to mind. I don't know how well I'm answering your question. I think, would you guys all agree that you can use science as a marketing tool these days? Like hashtag science to think. Um, <laughs> you've done a great job. That literally was not a thing 10 years ago. Um, there was, we, we were fighting on forums and battling, and I think over that time period, we, unfortunately, any time you have a war, you create two warring ideologies, where they're like anti-science and anti-bro stuff. Um, so somewhere around maybe 2011, 12, I personally started going, oh shit, we gotta pump the brakes a little bit, and really emphasize the fact that individual differences, preferences, uh, the, the means uh, of, and the limitations of science should be really emphasized. And I think that was around the time I really started reading um, stuff on the limitations of science because I know I was using it as a one tool and I was actually doing a disservice to my followers. When I started to see, uh, like one thing for example that really bothers me, because I think it's an unscientific way of interacting with other humans, is when someone's like, hey, I think ketogenic diet is great. And they're like posting on, say, like, like Brad Schoenfeld's Facebook or something like that. And before Brad can even respond, there's 600 people who are all like, oh, me, me, you're an idiot, blah, blah. I think that does, that's a huge disservice, and I think that's inherently unscientific. Like, I think that actually makes things worse. 
uh, because it turns people off from that community. It, it, it makes them dig their heels in. There's actually a fair amount of research showing that um, when conspiracy theorists are exposed to debunking information, they silo themselves off in social media and no longer engage with it. So I think one thing that I've studied and I think made me hopefully better at what I do is thinking about the way I interact with people and what's more likely to not turn someone off and maintain that open-mindedness so they can actually improve and get to their goals versus making them an out-group because they don't hashtag science. So. Any book recommendations or anything you've read in terms of your... Oh, any book? Not actually books. I've read a fair amount on... Just, just, in terms of engaging so, with people. So what you do is you follow Lane Norton's Twitter. Okay? And then you do the exact opposite. <laughs> uh, no, there's a good skeptic. Because he gives me... I can't, I, Mike, show me. I know Mike's got some good stuff here. Uh, get as much as you can in by Sam Harris, Michael Shermer. Um, there is an article called Critical Thinking. What is this? Critical What's Thinking. What is it good for? It's on a website called PSYCOP. It's an acronym. Critical Thinking. What is it good for? By Howard Gavinesh, I believe. Good luck spelling that shit. <laughs> um, it is the single greatest article on the internet. When you begin to read it, you will realize why I said that. It basically ex it explains what critical thinking really is. Um, and uh, did you want to? Okay. okay. Um, yeah. I, do you think you want to go and come back to me? Yeah. I mean, I, I would just say um, be open-minded, but not so open-minded that your brain falls out. Like, that, that, that's the best advice I can give you. Um, that's very, very difficult. And, um, you know, obviously, like, attending things like these, or like, I like doing this stuff because I get to hear on these guys and I learn stuff, you know? Um, but in terms of, like, honestly, the most I ever learn is working with clients. Just working with clients and paying attention. Like, if I'm doing the same thing five years ago, the, or I'm doing the same thing now I did five years ago, exactly the same way, and it, it's time for me to retire. Like, I stopped learning. So, now that's not, you know, change for the sake of change, just because you change. But, hopefully you're learning new things, and you're refining your ways of doing things, and you're getting better. Um, if you're just doing the same thing over and over and over and over, you're just not learning. So, hopefully that helps answer the question. As far as, like, getting better with debating with people, I usually just tell people, fuck off. <laughs> 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 that I deal with in exercise and nutrition, like uh, from a totally unrelated field. So yeah, to, so to get off what, what Mike was saying, yeah, reach out to other fields because you can learn quite a bit. Last thing on this huge rabbit hole, I think it's a really good idea to get a basic understanding of stats too. Oh yeah. I didn't understand how often <laughs> I was being bamboozled by just reading. Like basically, until I was half of my master's, I was pretty much just reading like. The intro and the discussion and conclusion. Because I got to the mid middle part and I just went. <laughs> yeah, and then there's like, I don't have math, come on, I'm sports science. So, but once I really dug in and, and, and learned stats, and it doesn't take much, but a little, it can go such a long way so that you don't get fooled by bad science. If you know stats well, you can look at anything and break it down. You really can't. Like, it is one of the most useful tools. It, people hate it, but man, I wish I had done more. Or just get a, a friendly relationship with James Krieger. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? Yeah, um, I'm so sorry. I didn't do that early question, it might be. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, so obviously, but, uh, I'll give this information out. But obviously, there's uh, a lot of variables to contribute to interpersonal variations in MME and MIV. Obviously, there's like genotypy slash environmental factors. But what I want to touch on is, um, obviously, uh, when we calculate volume, we obviously usually calculate it more often. That was interesting what you mentioned, Craig. But we often calculate it as sort of uh, low time for repetitions. But obviously, there's a range of movement uh, factor as well. So obviously, like for me, 1.8 centimeters forward versus someone at 160, we're going from the spot 180 to sixes. Obviously, um, my tissue need to contract and create more force to overcome my leverages and overcome the equilibrium, equilibrium that is gravity. What I wanted to um, is, do you think 
that uh, it's likely to assume that the individual who is shorter has a higher minimal effective uh, volume and a higher MIV than the individual that is taller because they, in theory, would accumulate more fatigue per repetition at the same given weight. On average, absolutely. That was easy. Cool. <laughs> <laughs> and do you have a measurable, is there like a... You should drop the mic right after that. <laughs> so is there a metric, like you might say, obviously there's so many other variables, but would, would be likely to assume that like, uh, what, like a percentage reduction or not? Is that, maybe there's, other, there's so many other variables. Like I, I haven't looked at that in any of our client databases or anything to try to figure out what the height relationship itself is. But uh, our MRV and all the other volume landmarks are so easily measurable and feedback yeah. for real training that you can just kind of eh, just be easy when you start and um, and then slowly uh, figure that out for taller folks. Uh, but also you can use um, RPE measures super fast before you even get formal measures of volume landmarks. Like for example, you you per program usually program four sets of squats per workout or something, and you get someone super short. Right, and uh, you know, they do, they do four sets, and you're like, how to feel? They're like, how what feel? That was a fucking warm up. You're like, might be. So you do eight sets later, or something. You know, it needs to ask go up. But if someone's like, you know, two meters ten or something, and you have four sets, they're like a religious experience for them. Then, <laughs> then you know, like descent into hell and then ascent back up. But it's not happening because you're still in pain. It's all hell. Um, and, uh, you know, then you're like, oh, that was really hard for you, the plenty is it in. So that, that there's even one session indicators of uh, probable trends in the volume landmarks. So you could instantly start auto-regulating and then more formally find the landmarks later. Because they take a couple of cycles to find. I can speak to that personally. Uh, you know, my best squat ever was 303 kilos. 225 kilos has never felt easy for me. Like, I always, one of the reasons I have trouble with RPE is I always perceive a high RPE. When somebody says, oh, just take it to an RPE set, I'm like, that's going to fucking hurt. Like, for me, I'm for, for squats in particular, an RPE of seven, I will have to get amped for that. Yeah. Like, because, oh, you shouldn't have to get amped for that. <coughs> you get amped in the gym? Sure. <laughs> <laughs> but, but somebody was like, well, you shouldn't have to, to do that for an RPE seven. Well, I can grind out three more reps extremely well. I'm very good at it. But, and people, <coughs> my favorite problems are well, well documented. Cool. Um, and so, yeah, just as a, 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 I don't know how much of that relates to that, but um, yeah, I always, and I will, at, you know, at nationals, I might, you know, for, for several years, I squatted the most weight. I also probably, of the top five, squatted the warm up weights slowest. Like, I was squatting five, at Worlds, I squatted 500 pounds, I promise you I squatted slower than every single person in my F1. I still squatted more than all. So, I always perceive that high RPE is one of the reasons I struggle with I would say, Brandon, your, your, your hypothesis of maybe tall people can't handle as much volume um, probably has some observational weight to it. You know, weight classes and powers up are essentially like high classes in disguise to a certain point. Um, and I would say that for the most part, when I talk to powerlifting coaches across multi nations and different exposures, they, they typically see lower volumes among like the 120 and 120 pluses. Um, that you do start to see that. Um, so I, I think there, there's something to that. I don't know if it's height, but certainly bigger people seem to uh, not need as much volume, not be able to handle as much volume. I think there's something to be said for if you've got to put 800 pounds on the back. That is just, you know, 90% of a one rep max for me is going to be up where somebody who 90% of the one rep max is 150 kilos. It may feel heavy for them, but it just, I mean, it, it's just, it's, there's some things that are just, you can't base off percentages or not the same. It may not be relevant, yeah. Joey? That was into my question. So I was going to say, uh, if there's any to why it's quite if you think the person would be more in absolute terms, be more than the person would be more in absolute terms. I would think so. Like, so if you were to look at um, strength scaling across weight classes, it's not just a perfectly linear thing. You have to do like allometric scaling to get. So you, you would think that uh, the load that one lifts, if it's not directly proportionate to someone's body weight, like obviously a 1.5 ton body weight squat 
is, is pretty good for a super, but it's trash for lower weight classes. And you would think that therefore, the stress imposed by, by different loads is not just the percentage of one RM. And that might explain why that observation we see of, of uh, heavier lifters not being able to handle as much volume or experiencing uh, more stress from a heavy set. Um, but, might give that more structure to you, yeah, but I, I don't think the structure scales perfectly with the amount of load they can lift with that structure, if that makes sense. Yeah. Um, so I, I don't think it's huge. And I think probably if you're comparing, like, let's say a 93 kilo a lifter to like a 74, it's probably similar enough that individual differences would outpace any difference on average between the weight classes. But I think when you start talking about extremes and you've got a 140 kilo lifter compared to uh, a 66 kilo lifter, you're, you're probably on average going to see some differences in terms of their experience of stress. It could be even unrelated to lifting. It could just be that they're 30% body fat and they walk walk upstairs that day and like they don't want to, like legs are going to be hard, you know. Um, like, yeah, if you were talking about talk to Kelly Branton about the like the life he leads to be a super heavyweight, it sounds awful. Like he's he's working very hard to be a super. You know, uh, he probably should be seeing that periodic staircase. He probably, that might help. So I may have trouble walking on that shit. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, side note: Did anybody see the study on Ray Williams? The Dexa scan of Ray Williams. They, they, it wasn't. The it was. Oh, it wasn't. I think it was. Oh, okay. Okay. Which is why it's twenty four. <laughs> but yeah, he was registered as 135 kilos of lead body mass or something like that. Just wrap your mind around this. Two, two Taylor Atwoods inside of him. <laughs> but just real quick, so the, the larger structures that are able to let you lift more weight when you're heavy also take a, a total absolute higher level of damage. There's more shit to fuck up. So <laughs> the recovery process is more pertinent. And the, um, another pertinent figure is uh, the ratio of peripheral, the ratio of musculature, skeletal muscle, and uh, tendon, bone, ligament, etc. damage during training. Uh, it, it's ratioed to the individual's gastrointestinal size. So when you have smaller people, usually relative to their body size, their GI tracts are bigger and they work relatively quicker, and they can just recover a person pretty well. But when you're fucking enormous, your GI tract doesn't exactly scale up, especially as you gain weight outside of what you're genetically sort of supposed to be. Like if you're double the size you were in high school, just out of sheer eating, you're gonna have recovery problems because your GI tract not necessarily designed to, to, you know, to be enormous. If you're just, there's some people that are built to be big, and for them eating is easy, you all, they almost always have really big, like just waists and hips and everything. Their stomach's fucking enormous. So of course, they can eat a shitload and feel fine. But if you gain weight up to a certain class, you're not really supposed to be, which most supers just weren't born like that. Uh, then it, it, everything is burdened, and your body's. So when you think, oh, well, like, how come they can't recover from as much volume? They, they, they have more shit to mess up from volume, which requires a bigger fatigue burden, more time to recover, and they may not have the, the GI, et cetera, systems. To, they're so far out of their abilities that everything's harder. So for a super compensation effect, the larger team would take longer. Say that again. For, for a super compensation effect, the person that's um, more is yeah. taking them longer than the. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Larger people require tapers that are double, triple the size of smaller people. You can have a small athlete ready within a week. Uh, some large, like Andre Milanichev, you know who that is? Uh, the best model for all time, I suppose. Um, uh, or the strongest human ever, or something. Uh, he pulls his last heavy deadlift three and a half weeks out before the beat. Uh, not just because it's 880, or sorry, 880 kilos would be sweet. Not just because it's 400 kilos, but because there's so much of him to fuck up that uh, you know that's just what it, that's just how long it takes to recover. Whereas some somebody you could have him peak you know within half a week no problem. Just do a little easier work. Another fact that it consider is obviously the labor length with a guy that's you know, 6 foot 10. Obviously the weight's going through a, a greater amount of distance from A to B. So say for instance a bench press, obviously the person's going through time and tension for long periods. And at yeah. more extreme joint angles potentially. Too. What's that? At more extreme joint angles. Exactly. Yeah, so if someone's really tall, they stretch their pack much more yeah. with longer arms at the bottom of the bench, or someone's really short, they're like, Timber! Yeah, same thing with the, the, the dead <laughs> Yeah, you know, basically, you take, you know, my tibia leg. Now you have a job. I believe you would say you might have 
fuck that shit up. <laughs> so like if you got my tibia, the bar is here, but as you make a bigger person, it's essentially a longer range of utility my body mass. So that's another reason like deadlifts are less inherently fatiguing if you're shorter. Because you don't have to get your back into a almost rounded position. It's gonna be more muscular tendons junction large or so. Yep. Where it does it to tear and off the Yeah, you can do the line scrub. There's a number of reasons why, yeah, like the deadlift is unique because it's a fixed position that's always gonna be in terms of body relative to the ground, not relative to you. Like if, you know, if you get a bigger back, you know, the range of motion decreases or enhance your arch, you just can't do that with deadlift. You cheat the sumo like we do, but that's the closest thing. <laughs> we got one more question. So, um, so I wanted to hear about each of your uh, general approaches. I realize that this could have a lot of individual context for people. Um, general approaches to contest prep. Um, what strategies might you, each of you be generally using now for a contest prepping male bodybuilder that you might not have been using a couple of years ago? How does it evolve for each of you? Good question. So. Uh, the big thing is that so like how, how far back should I should I go like maybe like two years <coughs> okay I think the big one now is I really emphasize diet breaks uh, that is something that I plan in and work in weeks of maintenance uh, so that means I take into account the fact that I want to start them a little bit earlier um, and I think about like my first port of call for when someone stalls and I feel like we've done everything we should have at that point in that phase of the prep is not, all right, now we're going to cut calories. I actually get a shot of a diet break first. And that often results in ending at the same body count we might have two, three, four years ago, but with higher total calories. And that's often a trade off and looking better too. There's a lot of, I won't observe better differences from that. Uh, and I think that's a trade off that most, of, not all of my competitors, with, with three lift, like yeah, I'll diet for another six weeks in total, but I'm better on stage and I'm on higher calories, my strength is going to maintain, and I'm uh, actually at a higher body weight on stage at the same body fat percentage. So that, that's a big one. The other one is not in contest prep itself, but in the actual uh, recovery phase afterwards. Um, I try to get someone up to around five to 10% over stage weight if they're done with their season within one to two months, so a little more aggressive the recovery briefing phase, and I've seen that do wonders for people's relationship with food, uh, starting an off season and actually getting, putting on muscle mass earlier versus you know running into a lot of issues with their food. And they're more likely to adhere to that versus following something a little more strict and then binging uh, and gaining weight even faster than they've done what I, what I would have recommended. So those are the big one, big two for me. Uh, I think that uh, Diet breaks, like Eric said, are, are something that I'm implementing more and more, or uh, consecutive refeeds as opposed to spreading them apart. There seems to be, so where is Jackson? So he's, he's actually doing research on this. Um, there seems to be some, and there's new unpublished data from Bill Campbell. Um, there seems to be something to, um, one day doesn't appear to really be enough to elicit enough change in terms of uh, metabolic, it might be a nice mental break. And originally, that's why I had people doing refeeds on a, on a single day, was it just gave them something to look forward to. I found that adherence was typically better if people found, just, and just for flexibility of lifestyle. Like, you can plan your refeed day to be on the day you know, to take your girlfriend or spouse out or boyfriend or whatever. Uh, go out, do something, you know, so adherence tended to be better. Um, but now, you know, there's evidence that you really need probably at least 48 hours of uh, minimum maintenance to see some kind of metabolic shift that allows for uh, better retention of lean body mass on the long term. And we don't know what the optimal is. You know, we're, we're, we're theorizing, you know, there was the Matador study that was two week diet, two week breaks. Um, that seemed to work really well, but in the words of Mike Zordos, they might have just found the second worst way of doing things. You know, it could be that it's three to two. Or it could be that it's three to one, or it could be that it's three to six. Like we just don't know yet. Uh, we probably won't know exactly, but um, you know, by starting to implement more of those protocols, um, we can hopefully kind of distill that down. It's probably individually dependent based on my experience with diet breaks. You know, so, some people it doesn't seem to make a real big difference for. Uh, some people it makes an absolutely freaking huge difference for. And I've seen. I mean, there are very few people who, when I start working with them, they can just kind of drop weight but we never have to really adjust it. I've had a guy now, I've had him on diet breaks and he's been with me for six months 
he has dropped 20 kilos of body fat and we have not had to touch his dieting calories once, which is extremely abnormal for that period of time. Um, now he's probably like hyper responded to that sort of thing. Uh, the other thing I would say I, I, I've done a lot differently, um, listen to a lot more client feedback in terms of um, the post-diet period and also like really trying to get people in a good metabolic position to diet. I don't like taking on clients just for contest prep. <coughs> I feel like I'm kind of behind the eight ball when I do that, and usually I'm trying to clean up other people's fuck ups at that point, especially with women. No offense to y'all. Y'all tend to yo yo diet a lot. Y'all tend to. Female clients are great because I, I have found on the whole, you guys have, I feel that they're more likely to just say, I'm going to go with what you say. I'm going to do what you say, and uh, you know I'm not going to give you a hard time about it. Men were more likely to kind of challenge you and whatnot, which isn't necessarily a bad thing. You guys, would you guys agree with that? But that also really works against females when they work with somebody who has no idea what the fuck they're doing. And that's who usually they get exposed to first, unfortunately. So um, I found myself just feeling like I've had to clean up a lot of people's messes and have it to tell people, you're not ready for prep. You're not ready for prep. You can't do prep right now. I can't tell you how many clients I've lost or potential clients I've lost over years doing that. But I really try to encourage people, and I encourage all of you, if you work with a coach, let them get used to you in the off season. Like get used to your metabolism, get used to how you work, get used to how, when there's not the stress of contest prep, and, and encourage your clients to give them price breaks and stuff if they work with you in the off season as well, because it's gonna make you a better coach going into contest prep because you've got some idea of how they work metabolically, how they work in terms of a, a coach-client interaction, and now you're not throwing the stress of contest prep on top of that. So that's probably one of the, the main things I've changed is really, and I probably sound like a salesman because I'm trying to sell them on, hey, this works a lot better if I can work with you in the off season. But really, uh, the people I have the best, the absolute best results with are the people that I have for several months of off season and then going into contest prep. I always have best results that way. And you got a book on that way at all. <laughs> yeah, I feel like I, somebody wrote a book on that. Oh, that would be contestprep.com. <laughs> uh, I don't really have much to add other than the, the same thing, the diet breaks. Um, I you know a number of years ago I wouldn't even have thought about just general just maintenance diet breaks for a period of time. And now it's something I regularly do, even uh, just with my Gen Pop clients. Um, I, I regularly program diet breaks, um, especially like if they've got stressful things coming up, you know, they're, they're going to have a stressful week at work. They're going on vacation. Like if I have a client who goes on vacation, I tell them, look, let's just maintain. I, if you maintain on vacation, that's great. You know, we don't have to, you don't need to be losing every single week. You know, and, and I try to teach them like, this is a long haul journey. This is not like, you know, a little sprint we're trying to do here, so. I'm not a whole big fan of diet breaks. I think you need to just be like, fuck train, brother. <laughs> <laughs> ah, eight Don't fuck diet. sit up. <laughs> Um, so yeah, uh, very similar kind of ideas. Um, I think there is always a trade-off in any fat loss diet, probably most diets generally, between a, um, a recovery of certain systems that tend to degrade slash build up as the diet goes on so that you can diet longer and more successfully. You have to trade that off with the idea of diet momentum. And a part of that is psychological, I'm sure, and not maybe physiological doesn't have as much to do with it, but it's nonetheless very important. So I'm uh, incrementally more a fan. I'm not a big fan of cheat meals. I'm not a big fan of reefy days. Um, I think weeks are better, and I think months are the best um, to really, really unplug. So what we like to do at RP is if I'm not, I don't coach any physique athletes anymore. Jared Feather does all of that, most of it anyway. And um, what we do with folks is we essentially have people in two different categories as they approach us for contest prep. One is, are you in the 10%-ish body weight, body fat range for males, 50 to 20 for females? If so, you can look at a show several months down the line and we can have you ready. If you are north of that by any number of uh, percent fat, you know, two or three north of that, you actually need two distinct diets the get you lean enough to have a jump off into contest dieting diet, and then a several month maintenance phase after will really cool everything down so you don't even remember dieting 
and then the grinder diet begins from 10% for men, 15% for women, um, and then it, so that's the diet, and then there's a contest diet. Does that make sense? And I think that's a literal several months, two to three months, two at minimum for most people, has to separate those two phases. One of the most, not most terrible, sounds like we're talking about fucking like world peace or some shit, but um, one of the most unfortunate uh, uh, occurrences in, in, in our industry is that uh, a lot of folks, and you know, well meaning, think that um, doing a show is like a cool goal to have, a short term goal, when they begin their process of fitness first time. So they'll be like 25% fat, and they're like, I want to do a show in like four months. And their coach is like, okay, and it just removes all their food, and they short, you know, they're shortly found dead in their apartment. But, um, <laughs> emotionally dead, but physically alive. Um, come on. But in any case, right, it, 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 it's this huge grand scheme that, you know, can you do a powerlifting meet a month after you start lifting? It, yeah, sure, it's not going to be super impressive, but you can participate. Bodybuilding is not a participation sport. It is a fuck you in the ass forever. <laughs> you fuck up. And, and you can have a sort of new pattern that, that pervades the rest of your life, and you end up with Lane, and he has to unfuck you. Uh, <laughs> I fuck you in the ass. I unfuck That's right. So we have a fee, but it's reasonable. <laughs> <laughs> If you want to get both weighed by Wayne and I, just let us know. Exciting and disturbing. So in any case, I, I, so basically, like you know, folks approach. I'm sure you've had a lot of clients tell you, "Hey, you want to do a show?" You know, if they're males and they're not in that close to 10 percent range, because the dip from 10 percent to I don't know three to six percent for a contest. It's like, it's like uh, I don't know, it's like putting your hand into cement. It gets harder the further in you go. So there's always the illusion that, oh, I'm pretty fucking lean. I'm like, you're not okay. It's going to suck. So you might as well be at 10%-ish before you start. Um, and also 10% plus is sustainable. So when you stop at 10% and you do that diet break, you can stay there as a male, 15%-ish for female, and you can stay there for a while and actually recover. Another really quick thing before we get off the line, don't mistake don't re-fuck up that process and be like, okay, I'm gonna get to like 6%, maintain, and then do a series of shows. You cannot maintain at that level of body fat. It drains you the entire time. And as a female, maintaining at sub-15 for very long makes you amenorrhea, it degrades your health long-term, uh, food issues, uh, so on and so on and so on. So multi-phase approach, and when clients come to you and they wanna get on, on stage, you tell them we got two diets ahead of us at least. Look, if they're 30, 40% body fat, that's like five or six diets, that's years down the line. Um, they just tell them, look, fucking body is not that fun anyway. It smells like shit back there. Like, everyone's gonna make it, everyone's pissed, you're still confusing, you're fucking the ass. Yeah. <laughs> that was fabulous, by the way. Mike and I have an unspoken competition about who can drop the most death bombs. So far, he's one. I have time to catch the fuck up. Um, so, two things, real quick. One, don't give people the wrong impression about diet breaks. Diet breaks are still dieting, okay? You're still, because if you want to maintain on a diet break, you have to be pretty rigid and pretty uh, tenacious in terms of how you track. That is all mentally draining, okay? So people will think, oh, diet break means cheat week. No, you'll get fat. Um, it, uh, it's also like Eric said, when you're dieting, you're circling the drain. And you're going to eventually get to the end of it. You hope you can just put it off long enough, all right? Diet breaks help with that. But while you're doing that, it is still mentally fatiguing. And my friend Corey Probst says something that I think is great. She says, self-control is fatiguing. It is. So when you think about, okay, well, I'm going to do this 50-week prep, and I'm doing two-week diet, two-week diet break, you don't do it. Like, it's not going to end up the way you think it's going to end up. Um, I like what Mike said about multi-phase approach. I said, uh, the other thing I would say is, do not take dieting lightly. Do not go to the well. Dieting is like war. Get in and get the fuck out. Now, I don't mean increase your calories rapidly afterwards either. That's not necessarily what I mean. I mean, if you're going to do a cut, do not fuck around on it. All right? I see so many people, I don't know if you guys get this, who are, oh, I just, I, I, I just want to get this 10 pounds off. I feel so much better. I just get up. And then they screw around on their little cut. They extend that out for months. And then they're back in the place they started. If you're going to do it, 
Do it. If you don't want to, I'm just not I'm actually mad about it. <laughs> <laughs> I But I've seen, like, I'm, I, I get riled up because I'm passionate about this because I've seen so many people, especially females, especially because you've been told you can be thin from a young age, that you go to the well so many times, and by the time you're 30, there's nothing left to go to. And I've seen people who, it's going to, like, they come to me and I'm like, you're, you're going to fail. I tell them this, you're not going to do what needs to be done in order to get out of this. Because it's going to be three years before you're ready to actually be able to do a show or be really lean. And nobody has that kind of patience. Nobody in this industry. Because Thomas Lauer is going to tell you, just drink fucking lemon water. Yes. <laughs> it's inflammation. <laughs> so, <laughs> dieting and shows can fuck you up if you're not careful. How many of y'all know it can fuck you up? How many been fucked up? All right, so this is not your regular sport where you're like, oh, this is a hobby and this is fun and I'm just going to go do it. Yes, it can be fun. It can be a great hobby if you do it correctly. If you do it incorrectly, it can ruin your life. So don't take it lightly. Don't go to the well more than you need to go to. And with that, I want Eric to drop in that bomb because I'll look Oh, Fraggle Rock. <laughs> <laughs> Is that the last question, Jacob? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.